Well, good morning, beloved church. It's truly a privilege to gather again once again as a body to worship God in singing, to worship God in our giving, to worship God now in the teaching of His Word. If you would, please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Beloved, unique to the New Testament ministry is the relationship between pastors slash elders and their congregations. Not until years after the church was born in Acts chapter 2 did such dynamic appear. None, obviously, was so used to usher this dynamic, if you will, more than the Apostle Paul, who himself instructed the church as to God's design and desire for proper Christian leadership of the church. This, of course, are pastors and elders. These are qualified men called of God to shepherd local congregations of believers with the primary roles being to protect and to guide. To protect and to guide. As faithful men exercise their spiritual responsibilities of protecting and guiding the Church of Christ, an unavoidable relationship surfaced between the pastor slash elder and their congregation. And this, I suggest, is by God's design. As an under-shepherd of, of the flock of God, said shepherd is called to lay down his life for the sheep. This requires that a shepherd have a genuine love and concern for the flock for whom he knows very well he will have to give an account before God one day. The, the Apostle Paul knew this firsthand. As a gifted evangelist and church planter, Paul developed deep relationships with the people in the churches that he planted, that he pastored. Many loved and respected Paul as their spiritual father, and in return, Paul loved them as spiritual children. Now, as a spiritual father and pastor... Paul often agonized over the churches that he established, especially as they came under the attack of those seeking to destroy the gospel of grace. Now this, of course, is the case in the Galatian epistle, which obviously we are studying. Now since the beginning of our study in chapter 1, we have seen Paul the Apostle. Paul the theologian, Paul the defender of the faith. But in our text this morning, we are going to see Paul the pastor. Paul the passionate lover of the souls of the believers in the Galatian churches. As you will notice when we read our text for this morning, Paul seems to take a bit of a mental detour. We know this to be somewhat characteristic of the Apostle Paul since it is evident in many of his epistles, such as 2 Corinthians, which we studied previously. Now you will find that in this section, Paul um, is going to present a very passionate and emotional uh, appeal. This is a passionate, emotionally charged section in which not only the Apostle Paul, but Pastor Paul bears his heart to his beloved congregations. And I say congregations because it was more than one. These are to the churches in Galatia. It's, not, it's more than one church. Now, Paul, therefore, gives us some insight as to this dynamic of ministry in the church as we see a pastor interact with his congregation, and in Paul's case, congregations. So, beginning in chapter 4 of Galatians, we'll read from verse 12 to verse 20. And then we'll seek the Lord's guidance in prayer. Follow along as I read. Paul the Apostle, writing to the Galatian churches, continues by saying, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. 
But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not des despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where, the, where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So I've become... So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. My children, with whom I again labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that today we get to see a different side of Paul. Obviously, he has never ceased to be a pastor, but as he began this letter, he was more a theologian, more a, an apostle. But now we get a little bit of insight into his heart towards his beloved congregation. Father, we pray that you would give us discernment, therefore, as to what we've just read. That you would give me clarity. That your people may hear and understand. So that they could apply and obey. Father, we know that without you, this would be impossible. So we ask that you go before us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, as you read this passage, I trust that you, uh, like me, see the difficulty in outlining this passage for the purpose of teaching. It is not a didactic uh, portion of Scripture as we have seen in the previous chapters thus far. Therefore, I decided to divide the passage by simply following the natural divisions of Paul's appeal and of Paul's argument, trusting that as we do, we will identify principles that are applicable even for us today. We are going to study these verses under five short divisions, or five, five short headings. And the first of this is this. First, in, chapter, uh, in, in verse 12a, we see Pastor Paul's appeal. Now, you will hear me uh, address Paul as pastor to really drive home the point. That what we have before us is not Paul the theologian or the apostle. Of course, he doesn't cease to be both. But we see more of a pastoral appeal now. So we see first, Pastor Paul's appeal in verse 12a. When he says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am. For I also become as you are. Now, given Paul's concern for the Galatians' departure from the basics of the gospel of grace towards more of a work-based Jewish system, he proceeds by begging and exhorting his beloved children in the faith to become as I am, which, interestingly, is the first imperative in Galatians. Prior to this, there's been no imperative. So here, here's a command, if you will, imperative that their pastor gives to his congregation to become as I am. Now, by this, Paul is requesting that the Galatians be like him in living a life of freedom from the law, which he already had explained was but a tutor to bring people to Christ that we learned last week in our, in our message. Now, of all people, Paul knew what it was to live under the bondage of the law. A Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, his Jewish pedigree was unmatched. He knew what it meant to live under the bondage of the law. There was no greater expert. But when Christ removed the blinders from his eyes and saved him, Paul realized that justification was by faith alone and not by works, lest any man should boast. Now, through the gospel of grace, Paul was liberated. 
He was freed from the bondage of a works-based system of justification by Judaism. In this freedom, Paul was asking the Galatian believers to join him. In that sense, be like I am. I am free to the law. Galatians, you accepted the gospel by grace through faith alone. But now you're placing yourselves under the bondage of the law again. I beg you, I implore you, be like I am, that is, free from the law. In this freedom, Paul was asking the Galatians to join him. In essence, then Paul is saying, I have come out from being under the law, and in that way I've become like you Gentiles, not bound to the law. Again, let me remind you that the, the primary audience is a Gentile one in the churches of Galatia. And becoming like them, Paul may have also be referring to his mode of ministry as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 9, 19 through 23. Where he says, for though, I am a free, uh, for, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being under the law myself, so that I may win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. To those not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win uh, those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. So, in essence, Paul's appeal then is one that comes from a concerned heart that of a pastor for his people, his beloved congregation, who unfortunately are under the sway of legalistic opportunists. Now knowing this, Paul exclaims, You have done me no wrong. And I suggest to you, he says this to ensure that the Galatian believers realize that Paul is not bitter in any way towards them. Even though it may seem that way, as we read chapters 1 through 3, where the Apostle Paul, out of love, was very direct. As through their backsliding. But he says, he assures them that he has, he, they have done them no wrong. Again, to assure them that Paul is not bitter towards them, but rather deeply concerned over their lack of discernment. Moving on then, we go from, a, from Pastor Paul's appeal to notice Pastor Paul's remembrance in verses 13 through 15. When he asks them to remember, if you will, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. Now, it is more most likely that Paul did not intend to minister in the southern region of Galatia, but due to illness, he had to stop his journey. Now, obviously, we understand that that's obviously provident God, the sovereign Lord, who may have even in illness used Paul to stop there and to share the gospel. Now, there has been much speculation as to the type of illness that caused the apostle to stop traveling. Some say he suffered from epilepsy. Others say that Paul contracted malaria, extremely possible in that region of the world, which obviously can affect a person's eyesight. And others speculate on Paul having some sort of eye disease based on passages such as what we have here in verse 14, but also in chapter 6, verse 11, where Paul says, See with, which, with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. For those reasons, many believe that he had some sort of eye infection, eye disease. Of course, no one could know for sure, but 
whatever it was, it must have been, it must have made Paul somewhat repulsive in appearance. For notice verse 14 of this bodily illness, if you will, that caused him to stop and preach the gospel to the Galatian, in the Galatian region, he says, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. Here Paul commends the brethren for not despising or loathing his physical appearance due to whatever illness he suffered from. But instead, notice, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Now, beloved, what does this say about the Galatians? And why is Paul commending them, reminding them? Well, it speaks to their original acceptance of the gospel of grace preached by Paul, whom they realized was not only a simple but yet faithful servant of God, but possessed even the authority of Jesus Christ himself. Not are not to surprise us, for in fact he is an apostle, a direct representative of Christ, sent by Christ in the authority of Christ. And also, they also realize that this sim that simply by listening to Paul's words and not by focusing on his external appearance, which according to Paul himself was a trial for his listeners. So whatever bodily illness he possessed, it was to the degree that affected him externally. There was some external manifestation of this disease that may have caused many people to wince, to maybe not look at him. And remember, not only in, 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 in Jewish culture, but even in pagan cultures, one would stop and ask, what on earth has this man done? The God would punish him that way. Now, of course, we know that's not true. But you could just imagine that his illness was to, to the extent that he was not very pleasant to look at. Perhaps not even, people may not even want to be too, too close to him or even touch him. We don't really know. But it was severe to the point that it was a trial for the Galatian believers. So Paul commends them. For not despising him or loathing him based on his physical appearance. And again, it speaks to the original acceptance of the gospel of grace preached by the Apostle Paul. Again, they realized simply by listening to Paul that his words meant something. They were empowered, obviously, by the Holy Spirit. And it was not that by focusing on his external appearance that they received what he said which according to Paul himself, again, was a trial for his listeners. Now, this is a wonderful reminder, beloved, that congregations, reminder to congregations, that of which is most important in a pastor. Obviously, it had not to be his external appearance, but the context of his heart and speech. Never mind what he looks like. Does he know Jesus? And can he help us know Christ better by teaching us his word? That is what matters. Beloved, think of the mockery that has befallen the church recently by pastors who look great on the outside. All these young, cool, tall, good-looking pastors who care more about their social media following than personal holiness. Of these types of pastors, John MacArthur says, it seems like they all shop at Forever 21, no matter how old they, how old they are. You know who we're talking about. They are seen with celebrities as such attend their services. They are asked for their autographs. And they are asked to pose for pictures by their fans so that they too may garner a larger social media following. 
Never mind what they look like and how many followers they have on social media. How are these, and I use quotes, how are these pastors leading the people to Christ? Is it through the popular culture or is it through scripture? Sadly, beloved, you do not have to look very hard to find the answer. Just look at their churches and listen to their music. That's all you need to know. These are not pastors. They are entertainers who tickle ears. They give people what they want. An entertaining religious experience. But not the Galatians. To their credit, at the very beginning, they didn't care what Paul looked like. They just cared what he said. He cared. They cared about what he possessed inside. They cared about the Savior that he proclaimed. And to the Savior to whom, they were, to whom they were led. They were transformed by the words of life spoken by an ill spokesperson who's not pleasant to look at, but one who had been transformed himself by God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What glorious memories Paul had of the way the Galatians received them, of the love that they shared due to the reality of the grace of God found in the gospel, which led Paul to ask then in verse 15, where then, notice what he says, where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked your, out your eyes and given them to me. In other words, Galatians, my spiritual children, what has happened to that fine spirit of yours? Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? You know that joy, that sense of blessedness that you felt when you experienced the grace of God through his gospel? That joy and appreciation that would have led you to give me your own eyes if you could? What happened to you, Galatians? Who has taken that sense of blessing from you? Now, this is somewhat of a rhetorical question, for Paul knew full well who did it. And this led him to ask yet a follow-up question which is the third division. It is this, Pastor Paul's question in verse 16, when he says, So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? It's sad that he would even have to ask that. But it's just so indicative of the fickleness of the human heart. Listen to what Martin Luther says here. He says, it is the role of friends to admonish us freely if we go wrong. And when we are thus admonished, we are wise. We are not angry with our friends for telling us the truth, but we thank them. We often see that truth produces hatred in the world and that anyone who speaks the truth is regarded as an enemy. But it is not like that among friends, much less Christians, unquote, says Martin Luther. Incredible insight. As Christians, as we suppose the Galatians to have been, they should have not been offended by their spiritual father rebuking them in love and warning them that they're getting very close to that line. But apparently, I don't think Paul would have ever asked these questions if he did not know that there was some animosity towards him from the Galatians. And like Luther says here, 
truth produces hatred in the world and that anyone who speaks the truth is regarded as an enemy. That is true, particularly as it relates to the world and, the, and Christians. But, like he says, it is not like that among friends, much less Christians. At least it ought not to be. But, beloved, here's a sad reality. One of the saddest realities in pastoral ministry is that those whom you would consider your closest friends sometimes end up becoming your enemies when truth lines are drawn. Even as non-pastors, most of you probably under, have experienced that. You can have a very best of friends. But then an issue comes up. And as a Christian, you say, I stand upon the truth of God. And you draw a line in the sand. Expecting your friends to stay on one side of the line with you. As they themselves proclaim Christ as Savior and Lord. As they perhaps themselves proclaim the belief in the inerrancy of Scripture. But then you are amazed, surprised to find them on the other side. It's really sad. But that happens. During prayer time this morning with my brothers, I shared uh, some news that uh, it's, it's not new news, but there's new developments. Uh, this is in regards to First Baptist Church Orlando. Huge church. <clears throat> Feel free to look them up and see what's going on there. They are openly receiving, baptizing, and welcoming to membership transgendered, homosexuals, cohabitators, Southern Baptist Convention, some within the convention, not the convention itself. They should be kicked out, but they're not being kicked out. Some within the convention have uh, appealed to the pastors, met with the pastors. And uh, they're confronted with the truth. And just to give an illustration to the reality of what happens where truth lines are drawn. A few pastors that approach the, the, the two main pastors of this church left feeling like they were the enemy. They presented the truth. A line was drawn in the sand, scripturally. And the pastors of First Baptist Church Orlando, I don't mind saying, look them up, okay? Basically said, we're on that side, you're on this side. In essence, you are now the enemy. Because you hate. That's what's going on right now. And it's sad. And I'll suggest to you that Paul felt something to that degree. You're my spiritual children, but yet you've, be, you, you, you've, you've fallen under the sway of legalistic opportunists who are trying to put you back under the law. And in so doing, they are making you my enemy. Or they are making me your enemy. Again, we are not to be surprised when this happens, beloved. For the Bible tells us that truth divides. Truth divides. Do we know that? Truth divides. Even Christ, as the way, the truth, and the life divides. He said so himself. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 36. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. On the earth, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Truth divides. Again, I'm, I'm almost certain that some of you understand that full well, as I do, even in, 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 in my family, immediate family. Where he said, thus says the word of God. This is what God says is wrong. This is what God says is right. I stand on the side of God. Where do you stand? And often they choose their lover, their sin, and forsake even family. But see, that's not what's the, the saddest part of it. You can forsake me all you want. The sad part is that you forsake Christ. When you do that. Now, 
With this, I love what John Stott says here as well, when he says, there is an important lesson here. When the Galatians recognized Paul's apostolic authority, they treated him as an angel, as Christ Jesus. But when they did not like the message, he became their enemy. How fickle they were, Stott says. How foolish. An apostle's authority does not cease when he begins to teach unpopular truths. But sadly, that is exactly what happened. And notice as we move on to verses 17 and 18 under the heading, Pastor Paul's Warning. He says, they eagerly seek you. They mean the Judaizers, the legalists, those who were seeking to put them back under the, well, not put them back under the law. They weren't, they weren't even Jewish. To put them back, to put them under the law. He says, they eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Beloved, Satan through his servants is very clever in beguiling simple people. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. This is exactly what happened in the churches of Galatia. These smooth-talking opportunists came in and began to beguile the Apostle Paul, began to, pre to teach against him. And in so doing, convincing the believers there in Galatia that they needed something more. That, sure, the Apostle Paul taught them the elementary principles of faith, but now they were to mature in seeking to follow dietary laws, circumcision, you name it. False teachers, beloved, always claim that their motives are solely to advance the kingdom of God and that they are moved by God's Spirit to teach the truth, which they assume was not being taught. They assume Paul was not teaching the truth so that those who sit under their teaching are properly instructed in truth. These false teachers basically offered salvation to those who accepted their teaching. Paul's gospel was deficient in some way. Theirs was the fuller gospel, which was nothing but a lie from the pit of hell. Salvation by works, that's what they were offering. Beloved, how often is it that when a pastor or group stands up and speaks against what is not true or wholesome and in return gets ridiculed and labeled as a hater, as one who is jealous for someone else's success to the point that people begin to question your motives for speaking out against unhealthy teaching or just flat out wrong teachings. Now you're the enemy. You're the intolerant. You're the hater. You're the whatever phobe. Fill in the blank. You're, you, uh, as, as believers in the inerrancy of Scripture, we're afraid of everything, apparently. We have a perpetual phobia of anything that is not to our liking. And that's not true. Again, Martin Luther is helpful here when he says, If vigilant and faithful pastors do not withstand the ravaging wolves, these false teachers will do great harm to the church under the pretense of godliness. No wolf ever comes into the church and announces himself or herself to be a wolf. They don't do that. But nevertheless, that is how they come in. Now, Paul is not jealous that they were seeking after his spiritual children. Notice what he says in verse 18. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I am present with you. In other words, it is always good, he goes on to say, to be courted with honorable intentions, as you were courted by me when I was there with you. But, as it is, 
No sooner had my back been turned that you let someone else come and court you with dishonorable intentions. And beloved, let me, let me assure you that cults, false religions, false teachers are experts at that. They will come and they will hang the moons and stars for you. They will bring you food. They will take you places. They will, they will do whatever is necessary to get you to believe that they really have your best interest in mind. And a lot of what they do, their modus operandi, is to speak against that which you had already been taught by, say, your local pastor. What does he know? We have greater revelation. We have this, we have that. It's really sad that it exists. And it's sad, even sadder, it works. So Paul's saying, look, you lack discernment. I'm not saying that it is bad that people would seek your approval and to court you, for lack of a better term. But they're doing it in a dishonor with dishonorable intentions. They're opportunists. Now, this leads us to the fifth division here. This is Pastor Paul's desire in verses 19 and 20. So obviously, with a, with, with a heart that is torn, concerned heart as a pastor, he says, now, my children. Now, we're used to this word being used by the apostle John. My little children, my children, term of endearment. Paul doesn't use this word, only here. He says, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Now, some might be saying, Paul, you're a man. When in the world, what do you know about labor? Well, he knows enough to know that it is painful, it's arduous in some cases, and he likens his labor of looking to have Christ be formed in them as his labor, agonizing labor, labor, travail, some translations have it. This is Paul's desire, that Christ be formed in them. It has always been his desire that Christ be formed in them. And he says, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Now, beloved, the difference between Paul and the false teachers, I think, is evident. These teachers, as all false teachers, seek to elevate themselves, their own name, to dominate Paul, on the other hand, simply wanted Christ to be formed in his spiritual children, in his listeners. Whereas these false teachers were selfish in their, in, in, in their desires, Paul was prepared to sacrifice himself for them. To be in travail until Christ was formed in them. To be in labor pains for as long as he needed to. Just so that Christ would be formed in them. Beloved, this speaks, I suggest to you, to the relationship that we see even now between pastors in general, that they have in general with their congregations. It is, or it ought to be, any pastor that is worth his salt, it should be his desire, the elder's desire, that Christ be formed in their congregations. Which, I suggest to you, looking back at what we just covered, leads to what we discovered. The desire that Christ would be, met, be, be uh, formed in the, the church drives a pastor to beg, to make appeals, to ask questions, and to warn. Do you see how that works kind of backwards? His desire for Christ to be formed in them, led him to beg, to appeal, to ask questions, to tell the truth, and to warn them. That's what biblical pastors do. 
as pastors, we only have one job. And that is to reflect Christ, not only in the way we live by example, but by the teaching of his word. That's it. It's not to make a name. It has nothing to do with how many followers you have on social media. It's not so that we can get invited to speak at the top conferences. That's not it. There's one, one goal. And that is that Christ would be formed in the people. So as you can tell, here is an appeal of a pastor to his congregations that were unfortunately under the sway of charlatans. He wished he could be there, but he couldn't. And leaves them a, it left them a little bit perplexed. But you know what? <clears throat> That's often the state of every pastor as it relates to the congregation that God placed under him. And that's not a bad place to be, I suggest to you, because when you are perplexed, you say, Lord, these are your sheep. I'm at a loss right now. Besides teaching the word, besides loving them, besides loving my wife as an example, besides living a life of holiness and purity, Father, these are your sheep. So in a sense, I suggest to you that Paul is saying, Father, I am perplexed. What to do about the Galatian church? And beloved, I suggest to you that the only thing that would allow him to go to sleep at night is for him to realize they weren't his to begin with. They are God's. So beloved, here again we see a pastor's heart and his appeal and his warning, asking questions to his spiritual children. May we be reminded, beloved, that we need to have a proper understanding of what is the pastor's and elder's ultimate responsibility, their duty, and what is the congregation's responsibility and duty. We understand that as spokespersons for the Lord, as pastors and elders, our primary responsibility is to exhort God's people with God's word. To live out what we believe, to exemplify what we teach, and the rest is up to the Holy Spirit. That's our job. That's our sole responsibility. Knowing that, if that is done, we can go before the Lord and not be overly terrified of having to give an account over every soul that ever sat under our tutelage. It's a sobering reality. But it's not sometimes, it's sometimes not easy, as we see the Apostle Paul share a little bit of his experience as a pastor of congregations. And I suggest to you the same, uh, the same goes on t today. So uh, I ask that you would just pray for your pastors, not only us, for your elders, not only us, but to those who are faithfully serving in, in big churches and little churches all throughout the world, that uh, we may remain faithful, knowing that it all revolves around the scriptures to the degree that we are able to bring God's people to himself through his word, then that's basically all that God would ask of us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this morning and the reminder that Pastoral ministry is interesting, and for the reminder that the enemy would love to come in and divide a congregation from their shepherds, and he often does that by implanting wolves that come in in sheep's clothing, preaching something contrary to that which was taught by their pastors, and in most grievous way like these false teachers did in the churches in Galatia who taught against the gospel of grace and taught a justification that was earned by human works. Father, we do not blame the Apostle Paul for his severe tone to his beloved children. That's what a beloved father does. Father, thank you for the reminder that often 
As we see in our lives, truth divides, truth separates. Father, as this world continues to get darker, and as the truth of Scripture continues to divide, even in greater ways, we ask that you would keep us strong. Strong in your word, strong in our resolve to stand upon your word and nothing else, regardless of whatever may come. Now, Father, this morning we are just overjoyed to be able to witness to young people make a public proclamation of faith in you. Lord, we understand that there's nothing better. Lord, we also understand that it is imperative that one who has been transformed by the gospel at some point make a public proclamation of their faith. Not in order to be saved, but because they are saved. Now, Lord, as our baptismal candidates are getting ready, I... I do beseech you, Father, that you know, you knowing everybody who is in this room, you knowing whether they are believers or not, I pray that if there be anyone among us that does not know Jesus as Savior and Lord, that you convict them of their sin to the degree that they call out to you for forgiveness, and that they would call out to you for salvation. Father, we know that none come to you unless you draw them. We ask, we ask that you would draw those who are not yet yours, even today. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior and Lord, I would ask you, I implore you, I beg you, to consider the reality that without him, there is no hope. Without him, there is no heaven for you. I would therefore ask that you would just simply acknowledge your sin before the holy God. Acknowledge that you have failed him, that you are guilty, and as such, worthy of death. But that in the name of Jesus Christ, you come seeking forgiveness, seeking to be washed, knowing that you are justified simply by faith. Oh, how I pray that that would be your, your reality here today if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.